A Summary and Interpretation of 12 Rules for Life by Jordan Peterson Narrated and Interpreted by Alexander Sandalis Rule 2 Treat yourself like someone you are responsible for helping Imagine 100 people are prescribed drug and one third of them won't even fill the prescription and half of the remaining 67 will fill it but won't even take the medication correctly They'll miss doses, they'll quit taking it early, they might not even take it at all, why is this? Physicians and pharmacists tend to blame the patients, psychologists tend to put the blame on themselves. This rule, we're going to explore why people tend to take care of others and their pets much better than they even take care of themselves. And this rule is going to expose a very stark reality and truth about the human experience that many of us share. People are better at filling and properly administering prescription medication to their pets than to themselves. That's not good. Even from your pet's perspective, it's not good. Your pet probably loves you and would be happier if you took your medication, if you were alive, if you were healthy. It's difficult to conclude anything from this set of facts except that people appear to love their dogs, cats, ferrets and birds more than themselves. How horrible is that? How much shame must exist for something like that to be true? What could it be about people that makes them prefer their pets to themselves? But before we explore why this is the case, which we will at the end, we need to define and understand the duality of chaos and order and how people can become unhinged because we need to understand the interaction between these two intangibles, chaos and order, in order to create a further understanding of how people create peace within their life and how people can let the evil and fire and chaos drive their life out of control. Because that is the underlying mechanism between why people don't take care of themselves as well as they do their pets. The domain, not of matter, but of what matters. Jordan is a man of science, but he's also a man of, how do I say? He speaks a lot about the intangibles, things that you can't touch, the things that you can't see, but the things you feel and the things that you suspect are there. These are primal constituents that are necessary elements to the interactions uh, that mold the world around us. And one of them is chaos, another one is order. The third is the process that mediates between the two. And some modern people call consciousness. Let's define chaos. Jordan defines chaos as the domain of ignorance itself. It's unexplored territory. Chaos is what extends eternally and without limit, beyond the boundaries of all states, all ideas, and all disciplines. It's the foreigner, the stranger, the member of another gang, the rustle in the bushes in the nighttime, the monster under the bed, the hidden anger of your mother, and the sickness of your child. Chaos is the despair and horror when you feel you've been profoundly betrayed. It's the place you end up when things fall apart, when your dreams die, your career collapses, or your marriage ends. Chaos is where we are when we don't know where we are, and what we are doing when we don't know what we are doing. It is in short, all of those things are situations we neither know nor understand. Order by contrast is explored territory. It's the structure of society. It's the structure provided by biology. Order is tribe, religion, hearth, home, country. It's the warm, secure living room where the fireplace glows and the children play. It's the flag of the nation. It's the value of the currency. Order is the floor beneath your feet and your plan for the day. It's the greatness of tradition, the rows of desks in a school classroom, the trains that leave on time, the calendar, the clock. Order is the public facade we're called upon to wear, the politeness of a gathering of civilized strangers, and the thin ice on which we all skate. Order is the place where the behavior of the world matches our expectations and desires, the place where all things turn out the way we want them to. But order is sometimes tyranny and stultification as well, when the demand for certainty and uniformity and purity become too one-sided. This is where it becomes imbalanced. You're in order when you have a loyal friend, a trustworthy ally. When that same person betrays you, sells you out, you move from the daytime world of clarity and light to the dark underworld of chaos and confusion and despair. 
This is the same place you visit when the company you work for starts to fail and your job is placed in doubt. When your tax return has been filed, that's order. When you're audited, that's chaos. Before the Twin Towers fell, that was order. Chaos manifested itself afterward. Everyone felt it. What exactly was it that fell? Wrong question. What exactly remained standing? So you understand the examples. They're very clear. We all experience the dichotomy of order and chaos on a day-to-day -day basis in many different versions. It's understanding that everything is in flux. You may be cruising happily down the road in the automobile you have known and loved for years, but time is passing. The brake could fail. You might be walking down the road in the body you've always relied on. If your heart malfunctions, even momentarily, everything changes. Friendly old dogs can still bite. Old trusted friends can still deceive. New ideas can destroy old and comfortable certainties. Such things matter. They're real. This is, I want to underscore this, this is something that Robert Greene discussed in his 48 Laws of Power something I underscored many, many times in my summaries of these laws. People can, everyone has the capacity to, to deceive, and it's better to understand the reality and potential of every human than to be blind and ignorant to it, which many people who call such books like Robert Greene's and maybe even Peterson's they call these books evil, uh, malevolent. Chaos and order, personality, female and male. Before we move on, it's important to understand the shadow versions of chaos and order. When I, when I say shadow, I mean what Robert Moore and Carl Jung discuss in the shadow versions of yourselves, the versions that get imbalanced and almost too strong and too prevalent. When there's too much order, too much chaos, Order, when pushed too far, when imbalanced, can also man itself destructively and terribly. It does so as the forced migration, the concentration camp, and the soul-devouring uniformity of the goose step. Chaos as a negative force is the impenetrable darkness of a cave and the accident by the side of the road. It's the mother grizzly, all compassion to her cubs, who marks you as a potential predator and tears you to pieces. Chaos is when the monster under your bed is actually a monster under your bed. So how do we mediate between two of the most important constituents in a human's experience, order and chaos? How do we how do we integrate ourselves between the two harmoniously? And Peterson suggests this. To straddle that fundamental duality is to be balanced, to have one foot firmly planted in order and security and the other in chaos possibility, growth, and adventure. When life suddenly reveals itself as intense, gripping, and meaningful, when time passes and you're so engrossed in what you're doing, you don't notice. It is there and then you are located precisely on the border between order and chaos. And that is it. When I read that, I'm like, that's it. It's not about not having one or having the other. It's about having both and being able to interface with both bravely and having one foot placed in each camp. I'm someone who enjoys the comfort and security of order a lot. It makes me feel secure, safe, and calm. There's no anxiety when I have order. But order is not enough, Peterson says. You can't just be stable and secure and unchanging because there are still vital and important new things to be learned. And this is where chaos comes in. The ignorance is chaos. The not knowing and learning is chaos. Challenging your beliefs like he is doing to me and like through me, hopefully I am doing unto some others. Can't tolerate being swamped and overwhelmed beyond your capacity to cope while you are learning what you still need to know. Thus you need to place one foot in what you have mastered and understood and the other in what you are currently exploring and mastering. Then you have positioned yourself where the terror of existence is under control and you are secure, but where you are also alert and engaged. That is where there is something new to master and some way that you can be improved. That is where meaning is to be found. The Garden of Eden. Now Jordan goes on to tell the story of Adam and Eve and the many interpretations of this story. 
I'm not going to go through that right now. Instead, I'm going to pull out a very uh, poignant argument that Jordan has talked about on overprotecting parents. Alexander Solzhenitsyn insists the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being. Understand that. There is simply no way to wall off some isolated portion of the greater surrounding reality and make everything permanently predictable and safe within it. This is a problem that is, I want to say problem, uh, this is an issue. Yeah, it is a problem. It's a problem, it's an issue that is being brought up in uh, through Peterson and people are like to him, where are we creating these safe spaces for people to have equal, uh, opportu equal opportunity of outcome, which is a problem. And also creating extra safe spaces for people where they can't even make, that shield them from mistakes and shield them from the reality of the evil and danger of the world. So Jordan says, yep, there's no way to create some perfect isolated space that permanently permanently uh, creates safety because no matter how carefully excluded you are from the evil something will sneak back in a serpent metaphorically speaking will inevitably appear and that is a metaphor from the Adam and Eve story he previously told even the most Assiduous of parents cannot fully protect their children even if they lock them in the basement safely away from drugs alcohol Porn and that extreme case the too cautious too caring parent merely substitute him or herself for the other terrible problems of life when these overly cautious protecting parents shield their son or daughter from the potential evils of the world They end up replacing the evils. They think they're protecting them from with themselves that's what that means to me. It's like you have become the very evil that you were too scared to expose your child to and you've become it in a different form. It's in a form that most parents can't see because you really have to look in the mirror deeply and analyze yourself to understand the ramifications of creating this bubble. Even if it were possible to permanently banish everything threatening, everything dangerous and therefore everything challenging and interesting, that would mean only that another danger would emerge, that of permanent human infantilism and absolute uselessness. How could the nature of man ever reach its full potential without challenge or danger? Question for parents. Do you want to make your children safe or strong? So after many pages of Jordan uh, telling his the story of Adam and Eve and all the interpretations through that, we finally get to the point. And the original query, why would someone buy prescription medication for his dog and then so carefully administer it when he would not do the same for himself? Why would he care for the animal more than he cares for himself? Now that we understand chaos and order and the underlying mechanisms of how we interact, let's address this. The problem is, we know so much more about ourselves than anyone else. We know the full range of our, our secret transgressions, insufficiencies, and inadequacies. No one is more familiar than you with all the ways your minds and body are flawed. No one has more reason to hold you in contempt, to see you as pathetic, and by withholding something that might do you good, you can punish yourself for all your failings. See, we know all the deep, dark, insanities of and chaos of our mind we, we know all this about ourselves and we obviously shelter and share quite little of it and so we come to think of ourselves in a poor light but a dog is harmless innocent and unselfconscious it's clearly more deserving then of medication of being taken care of Dogs are predators, so are cats. They kill things and eat them. It's not pretty, but we'll take them as pets and care for them and give them their medication when they're sick regardless. Why? Why do we do this? They're predators, but it's just their nature. They do not bear responsibility for it. They're hungry, not evil. They, do, they don't have the presence of mind, the creativity, and above all, the self-consciousness necessary for the, inspired, for the inspired cruelty of man. So we do not bear them the responsibility for their actions because there's no intention behind those actions. There is for humans. And that's the problem. 
and the good thing. But the problem, because we, we understand the ramifications of our intentions and our actions, and often people's actions, well, day by day by day by day, we, we take actions either towards order or towards chaos, sorry, towards good or towards evil. And it seems like the people who take more steps towards evil, and I don't mean evil as in harming people, it can be as little and as simple as politeness, not saying thank you. It can be as little as simple as harboring resentment, as not communicating with your partner the, the thing that bothers you. It's being bothered by the thing that you probably shouldn't be bothered by. It's all these little things that add up towards evil. Evil just doesn't mean what we think it means. It, it doesn't just express itself in the Holocaust. Evil just doesn't express itself in the worst atrocities of mankind. Evil expresses itself in the small mundane actions as not eating right, not being physically active. I digress. Unlike us, predators have no comprehension of their fundamental weakness, their fundamental vulnerability, their own subjugation to pain and death, but we know exactly how and where we can be hurt and why. This is good a definition as any of self-consciousness. We are aware of our own defenselessness, finitude and mortality. We can feel pain, feel self-disgust and shame and horror and we know it. We know what makes us suffer, we know the dread and pain can be inflicted on us and what means we know exactly how to inflict it on others. We know we are naked and how that nakedness can be exploited. And that means we know how others are naked and how they can be exploited. We can terrify other people consciously. We can hurt them and humiliate them for their faults we understand only too well. We can torture them, literally, slowly, artfully, terribly. That's far more than predation. That's the entry of the knowledge of good and evil into the world. That's the transformation of being into a moral endeavor, all attendant on the development of a sophisticated consciousness. Only man will inflict suffering for the sake of suffering. That is the best definition of evil I've been able to formulate. Animals can, can't manage that, but humans with their excruciating semi-divine capacities most certainly can. It is for that reason that we really struggle to treat ourselves as well as we would for an animal or someone we care for. Given that terrible capacity, that proclivity for malevolent actions, is it any wonder we have a hard time taking care of ourselves or others, or even that we doubt the value of the entire human enterprise? Perhaps man is something that should never have been. Perhaps the world should have been cleansed of all human presence so that being and consciousness could return to the innocent brutality of the animal. I believe that the person who claims never to have wished for such a thing has neither consulted his memory nor confronted his darkest fantasies. And confronting the darkest fantasies is the only way, is the only way you can get through this. Confronting your darkest fantasies is the only way you can treat yourself like someone you're responsible for helping. You need to come to terms with the capacities that we have for order, good, to order, chaos, good and evil. If we wish to take care of ourselves properly, we would have to respect ourselves, but we don't, because we are, not at least in our own eyes, fallen creatures. If we lived in truth, if we spoke the truth, then we could walk with God once again and respect ourselves and others in the world. Then we might treat ourselves like people we cared for. We might strive to set the world straight. We might orient it toward heaven, where we would want people we cared for to dwell, instead of hell, where, we res where our resentment and hatred would eternally sentence everyone. See, the problem is people think they're too inadequate. They don't believe in themselves enough. They don't love themselves enough because they haven't earned the right to feel those things because they haven't. Back to the original point about overprotective parents. If you do not challenge your child, your daughter, your son, hey, you don't have a child, great. If we don't challenge ourselves enough, outside of our comfort zone, outside of the safety of one's home, then how are we to ever think beyond inadequacy? How are we ever to think truly greatly about ourselves?
You do not simply belong to yourself. You are not simply your own possession to torture and mistreat. This is partly because your being is inexorably tied up with that of others and your mistreatment of yourself can have catastrophic consequences for others. This is most clearly evident perhaps in the aftermath of suicide when those left behind are often both bereft and traumatized. What I do unto me, I do unto you. We are all connected. What I do unto me, I do unto you. The way I treat myself is not only a reflection of how I treat the world, but actually how I treat the world. See, it's not... It's, it's, it's like mistreating yourself is orientating not just yourself towards hell, but your surroundings, your peer group, your family, your friends. We think we're all like... Like, we all individual, we all are only able to see from our consciousness and our eyes. But there are nearly 8 billion other people seeing the a version of what you're seeing. The amount of people we interact in our lifetime and have some small influence on is monument. It's like it's monumental. If everyone was able to just orient themselves towards a little more good, towards heaven, then we, we can really have a monumental impact on, on a civilization, right? If we, just if we just treat ourselves a little better, then we treat everything else around us better. And what's absolutely incredible, Jordan points out, is that there is, there, think about it, there's 8 billion people on the planet, look at what we've created, just have a look, look at what technology, this, that, like, there are so many ways things can fall apart or fail to work together. And it's always wounded people who are holding it together. Like, think about it. If anyone's fortunate enough to be in a rare period of grace and health, personally, then you probably know somebody who's going through some type of uh, crisis with their health. Yet we all prevail and continue to do difficult and effortful tasks to hold ourselves and their families and our society together. And this is miraculous. This Jordan points, this is miraculous. Like, it, it's often wounded people, who are, as I said before, who are holding it together. And they deserve so much more credit for what they're doing. And admiration. It's an ongoing miracle of fortitude and perseverance. People are so tortured by the limitation of and constraint of being that I'm amazed they ever act properly or look beyond themselves at all. But enough do so that we have central heat and running water and infinite computational power and electricity enough for everyone to eat and even the capacity to contemplate the fate of broader society and nature, terrible nature itself. All that complex machinery that protects us from the freezing and start Freezing and starving and dying from lack of water tends unceasingly towards malfunction through entropy and it is only the constant attention of careful people that keeps it working so unbelievably well. Some people degenerate into the hell of resentment and the hatred of being, but most refuse to do so despite their suffering and disappointments and losses and inadequacies and ugliness and again, that is a miracle for those with eyes to see it. It's nothing short of incredible. When I first read this, I'm like, It's amazing. Those who tend to see the, the world with half glass empty, right? The pessimists, the, the, the negative among us. These people tend to point out all the atrocities and, and terrible parts of, of the human experience and the media loves to, the media uh, works as a business by pushing an agenda of negativity or because negativity is louder than positivity. By pulling all the most saddest and depressing stories from around the globe, which happens all the time, every day, because the capacity of people we have, there is something happening right now of every second that is bad, but it is dramatically outweighed by the good that is happening. And the reason it is, and the reason I can say that with such confidence is that we're here. 
we're here, we're still here. And if evil and hell was overtaking good as the media and the pessimistic of those around us will have us want to believe, then we wouldn't be here. We would have blown each other ourselves up already. I, I believe that. You know, I think we would have we would we would have been done. We, we would World War Three would have been over with. That you know, but we're still here. You know, we have a lot of work to do, but we're still here. And people like Peterson are helping orient people like me towards a little more good. And if we can get a, just a few more people every day to just push themselves towards the heaven rather than the hell, then we, we can we can last a little longer as, as a civilization. You know, it's, it's much bigger than the individual because we're, we're all interconnected. Hatred for self and mankind must be balanced with gratefulness for tradition and the state of astonishment at what normal everyday people accomplish. We deserve some dis respect. You deserve some respect. You are important to other people as much as to yourself. You have some vital role to play in the unfolding destiny of the world. You are therefore morally obliged to take care of yourself. You should take care of help and be good to yourself the same way you would take care of help and be good to someone you loved and valued. You may therefore have to conduct yourself habitually in a manner that allows you some respect for your own being. Because if, if there's never more been a reason to take care of yourself now, here it is all laid out. It's not just it's not just taking care of yourself. It's much bigger than that. Jordan Peterson is an example of that. I don't know if I don't know how many people know, but he was going through serious medical problems with himself and his daughter, autoimmune diseases, and 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 a whole host of uh, problems that depression that were debilitating both of them. And, and he had a family to to help govern and run, and he's going through this for, through through the decade through the last. Uh, 10 to 20 years where he was writing maps of meaning and where he was doing his lecturing and trying to put a little more good in the world and imagine if he didn't imagine if he said no this is too hard this is too this is too much i'm not gonna do this i, I can't right if he didn't we wouldn't be here with i wouldn't be right here but he did he did it anyway because he knew he had to he knew it was the right thing to do to conclude to treat yourself as if you are someone you're responsible for helping is instead to consider what would truly be good for you. This is not what you want. It is also not what would make you happy. Every time you give a child something sweet, you make that child happy. That does not mean that you should do nothing for children except feed them candy. Happy is by no means synonymous with good. You must get children to brush their teeth and put in their clothes even when they might object strenuously. You must help a child become a virtuous, responsible, awake being capable of full reciprocity, able to take care of himself and others and to thrive while doing so. Why would you think of it acceptable and do anything less for yourself? You need to consider the future and think, what might my life look like if I were caring for myself properly? What career would challenge me and render me productive and helpful so that I, that I could shoulder my share of the load and enjoy the consequences? What should I be doing when I have some freedom to improve my health, expand my knowledge, and strengthen my body? You need to know where you are so you can start and to chart your course. You need to know who you are so that you understand your armament and bolster yourself in respect to your limitations. You need to know where you are going so that you can limit the extent of the chaos in your life. Restructure order and bring the divine force of hope to bear on the world. You must determine where you are going so that you can bargain for yourself so that you don't end up resentful, vengeful, and cruel. You have to articulate your own principles so that you can defend yourself against others taking inappropriate advantage of you and so that you, you are secure and safe while you work and play. You must discipline yourself carefully. You must keep the promises you make to yourself and reward yourself that you, you can trust and motivate yourself. You need to determine how to act toward yourself so that you are most likely to become and to stay a good person. It would be good to make the world a better place. Lastly, don't underestimate the power of vision and direction. These are irresistible forces able to transform what might appear to be unconquerable obstacles in traversable pathways and expanding opportunities. Strengthen the individual. Start with yourself. Take care of 
with yourself. Define who you are. Refine your personality. Choose your destination and articulate your being. As the great 19th century German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche so brilliantly noted, he whose life has a why can bear almost any how. You can help direct the world on its careening trajectory a bit more toward heaven and a bit more away from hell. Once having understood hell, you could decide against going there or creating that. You could aim elsewhere. You could in fact devote your life to this. That would give you a meaning with a capital M. That would justify your miserable existence. That would atone you for your sinful nature and replace your shame and self-consciousness with the natural pride and forthright confidence of someone who has learned once again to walk with God in the garden. You could begin by treating yourself as if you are someone you are responsible for helping.